I don't remember being a time when I wasn't making things. Um, so I've got a lot of memories as a as a child, sitting around a kitchen table wanting to make stuff. So I think my answer would be there was never a conscious choice. It was just part of who I was. Yeah, and actually, absolutely the same is true of me. So my very earliest memories are about making things. And I'd say I started making things as soon as I could hold a pair of scissors. So does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, craft is often considered an immersive activity. So how does this apply to your own practice? And what is the balance in approach between cognitive thinking and haptic or fine motor skills? Do you have I can't give you... A, I can't really say the balance. I don't know. Uh, I, I sometimes don't know where an idea will come from, for instance. Sometimes I, I do think around a thing, you know, an idea will occur to me of something that I want to do. I can't tell you why I want to do it. Uh, and I will, I will think about how to, I will think why, and, and I will sometimes work out why I want to, what it is I want to express through making this piece, for instance. You know, some of the work that I do is purely because I, I, a form has caught my attention and I want to create this form in a, in a sculptural way and there's, there is, there's nothing deeper in it but sometimes the pieces of work have an idea in them. I would say most of, of my practice would be about physically making there's only so much thinking I feel I can do about things and then it's I have to try it out, I have to make it, see if it works, see if it see if I saw it uh in a in a in a good way. Sometimes it changes as I'm as I'm making something because it just it's not gonna work or I don't like it or I will make something and then reject it because it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted, it doesn't come close. Um so so there's there's both in there, really. It depends on, on what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it does feel really immersive. And I think it's a mix of, of all those prompts that you've put down there about it being informed and responsive and intuitive and all those things. Um, and you get immersed in those elements at different points of what you're doing. But I do recognise myself as quite a thinker so that that balance between thinking and the motor skills I sometimes wonder if I think a bit more than some may so I spend a long time ruminating and incubating an idea and kind of tossing it round in that there's a stage at which it's sort of um, uh, any amount of possibility in your head really and you're just um, considering all the different ways that it, it might come out um, and there's also part of me that's probably a slight personality thing where I kind of want to be able to see and get a sense that it might it might work I have to kind of to some extent see that there's a possibility of this thing happening um, and sometimes that cognitive bit takes quite a long time and some of the thinking about how to bring an idea together or how to bring a whole pile of things together that can take a long time um, for me that feels a bigger part of what I do than the haptic um, sort of responses so I work a lot with textiles and for many people that haptic fine motor element is huge for them it's really comforting and um, mindful really it's a big movement on it really but I've just that slow steady away stitching um, and the feel of text, uh, textiles and not wanting to change the handle. None of that's really important for me. For me, it's about what materials I can bung together to bring an idea out. And um, I don't think I work as much with how something feels, but I do um, recognise that kind of being in, informed and... Um, understanding what a material can do so because of all my experience up to this point 
I have a sense of what will happen if I try and tear a piece of material or paper a certain way mm. or, you know, try and glue something a certain way. You you just, you don't think about that knowledge, but it is in there. So you, in the moment, you have that at your disposal, really, that sense of knowing about a material, I think, I'd say. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd agree. And what I sometimes... It's, going on from something that you said, sometimes an idea will start hatching in my mind and it can take up to two years. It's like I can see it dimly and then something will just click and it becomes clearer and then I start thinking about the construction. Um, so I kind of see an image which, which, because of the way I work, I then start working out in a 3D way and then that yeah that knowledge of materials then starts to come in and then it just has to be made be because you don't know <laughs> I think I think with me I I, I, w I would describe myself more on the art side than the craft because I'm driven by bringing an idea into reality and mm. um I wouldn't want to keep repeating something. It's conceptual, I suppose, in that sense. So there's that fog of possibility and mulling something around. It's all very grey for a long time. Mm. And then you suddenly begin to see how that idea might come about. And then and then I would use different materials in the way that I needed to, to, yeah. To, to make be, it happen. To make it happen. Yeah. Mm. And to what extent has prior education, both specialist and state-led, contributed to the understanding and ongoing development of your practice? Um, well, I'm someone who's done art and craft all my life, but I've never done it at school. I don't. I actually don't remember any art lessons in secondary school. I remember doing a few things in primary school. Again, not not art, but I can remember drawing when I was doing projects, um, and I can remember things like making binker bookmarks and pencil cases, and some of those things were lovely at, at primary school. Um, so there was a bit of that. Um, secondary school not at all um, so in terms of state-led education that hasn't really that's not part part of it really um, specialist there's so I've done some other things which were not state-led so um, I've done adult ed classes um, watercolor and ceramics and I do see that things that I've learned there uh, of kind of been brought into into my practice and I've developed my practice because of them so one example would be I know how watercolours work and I I enjoy the way that they they blend together and sort of drift together and the quality of that I think I use a bit of a painterly approach in the way that I use colour in my mixed media art and I continue to like to paint actually even if it's with layers of fabrics and stuff it's almost like painting and, and, and using that kind of color, color knowledge there so and I've done a bit of photography and you use the skills that you know you've used uh, in in that field in what I do now um, so there's some transferable um, skills in that in that sense but I haven't done anything formal um, I did do a course um, with an artist called Kim Titterjai called Experimental Textiles, which um, just laid a few foundations and acted as a catalyst really for me to explore things in a um, a deeper way at a time I was ready to do it. And um, I, I do feel that that was a real um, starting point for uh, my art at the moment, really. Mm. And I um, did do art at school. I don't remember much in primary school. Um, I did. I remember doing a lot of art in my uh, high school, throughout high school. It was, you know, one of the, the core subjects. And um, I did art for A-level as well. I have to say, at the time, it was extremely limited because it was about painting and drawing. There wasn't much after that. Um, I went to teach a training college where I did art as my main subject and that's where I learned a lot. I did, um, you know, pottery and um, screen printing, textiles, all sorts of things. Uh, 
and so I, I had a good grounding there uh, in a lot of techniques. The thing that I think gave me gave me a lot of value was adult education because it allowed me to carry on um, working with ceramics, which I did for a number of years uh, much later. Um, I also did metalwork, which I loved, and um, it introduced me to uh, papier-mâché, which I then built a whole career on, starting from that. So I can't speak, I personally can't speak highly enough of the adult education programme. Um, and but most of my practice has been self-taught it's like I took the, the core of something which um, interested me and worked for me and, and like just developed skills with materials myself just because of a, a, a passion for it really yeah. and I th- I'd have to add which you didn't say the, in the first question is is that actually part of the reason I'm a maker? I think is because I grew up in a family of people who made things. So mm. um, none of none of my education in a formal sense, you know, happened at school. I completely agree that adult education was a real blessing. I really enjoyed doing that. Mm. Um, but actually, what I learned and my love of it and the skills in terms of sewing and drawing and making all happened at home outside of the formal education. That leads yeah. nicely on to the next question, really, because, you know, following on from your, your formal education, how, how does your practice continue to evolve? And are there any additional factors or inherited knowledge that has contributed to this? So the, the idea of mm. Mm. handing down the skills from family and friends is yeah, very okay. poignant yeah. to that. Um, yeah, I grew up in a family. Um, they were Polish refugees. So... Um, brought with them uh, a whole wealth and a tradition of making, of mending and making. So my father was very handy. He'd mend anything, he'd make anything. And so I learned from quite a young age to handle tools. For instance, I was very familiar, you know, with pliers and cutting cutting things and all that sort of thing. And then from my mother and grandmother, what you might call the softer skills of, yeah, knitting, crochet, sewing, just that whole idea of making was there around me the whole time and access to uh, anything that I wanted to do and paper and pencils. So I I had a rich background in that sense. I was encouraged in that way. So I feel how that contributed, um, you know, together with with what I talked about in the previous uh, question, I feel that what I have is a a very, very rich bank, a, a very rich account of skills that I can call on and a knowledge of um, different mediums that that's just there you know I, I can I can draw on a lot of things is what I feel um, so like I said I got a lot from my family um, my dad is a chemist um, I think fair to say um, unless you were really shining light art was usually not seen as a career option and actually I always knew I wanted to be a teacher from about the age of five um, so I, that's probably part of the reason for not taking it at school the choices I, it was that or French <laughs> French um, but my dad my dad is a scientist and I did science I was quite interested in biology and that kind of thing so I think I've inherited or um, they fostered some dispositions that you need to, to make really so some of that is that problem solving and tenaciousness and persistence to you know work at something test things out you know have a have a bit of a hypothesis about something and then see if you can make it happen mm. so I, I think from a completely different field maybe some of that's come in um there's also actually something in the disposition of if in my family which was if you're going to do something it's worth doing well um so i think that that actually um spurs things on um but then i do see a lot of new things happening in the textile world um which where and and shows and exhibitions and things like that are a part of how i kind of carry on because people will use things in new ways and they give you ideas of you know possible ways mm-hmm. of doing things so um i use a lot of tea bag paper um 
in what I do, which is discarded rolls of stuff you make tea bags out of, and people have done some very interesting things with that, and and then I've taken that on and done a lot myself. So you see something someone else has used in a bit of a different way, and then you can take that on. And I think that comes partly from um, the web, actually, and then partly from shows and stuff. Um, I don't use a lot of technology in what I do, but I know other textile folk would in things like printing your own fabrics and um, so what I do use is very low level technology if that's the right word so I really like vintage tools and you know things yeah. that are actually yeah. bits of technology they're just basic um, hand tools and things I, I really like that and I use technology as a way of understanding my work um, so I will take a lot of photos of what I do um, and I'll write about the process because I'm really interested in the process of making so that I use that in a way to reflect and kind of understand what's gone on and what I've done and look back and um, I do recognise that I use technology heavily for that um, even though I don't use it in my work Yeah and I actually thinking about that yes I do uh, use the internet a lot for research I have found that good because like I want the underneath of a heron's head it's there I'll find it eventually <laughs> you know that's where it's useful and there was something that you said as well um but I've lost what it was now no I can't remember it might come back but in both cases you feel that your practice is evolving through prior learning or prior experience yes there was a there was a groundwork I've just remembered what it was contact with other people mm. I, I live in a very isolated place I don't have huge contact with with a lot of creative people but I do find that um, just seeing what someone else is making or having a conversation with somebody or like just learning a new technique mm. because you see someone else using it, it it all comes in and and adds it feeds and opens new possibilities for you I think we discussed earlier about what was What's really nice about this project is learning from each other, even though mm. our disciplines are not too dissimilar. Um, so we we talked about the fact that you work in 3D, and so when the chair came and you were in Ireland and you couldn't see it, mm. um, you had the dimensions of it and you made a, a tiny little scaled model, model yeah, of it yeah. in order to kind of visualise what we might do. Um, and sent me some photos of that. And then I just printed the photos off and drew on them because I can't draw that well. Um, but then since then we were chatting that some other work that I've done, I, I kind of thought, right, I'm not going to launch straight into it. I will make a maquette, as you call mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. um, t to test this piece out So because, you know, you don't want to waste y your time and effort. So that was just one tiny example. But um, you do that kind of thing all the time. You learn from each other and you forget that you've, you've done it really along yeah. the way. Um, yeah, cross fertilization. Mm. Mm. So you both value the collaboration in craft and this, the make of projects has kind yeah. of allowed you to develop that further. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. it's challenged the it's challenge it's been challenging um, around the concept of what we wanted to do. So there was a lot of tugging at uh, kind of getting to the core of what we both um, wanted to do in a in a completely amicable way and. Um, it was exciting, really, mm, but just mm. tossing all these ideas around and trying to get to what it was that we wanted to do um, and then working out ways that we could sort of respect each other's specialisms and work with that. Um, and yeah. yeah. And it's been, yeah, it's been one of the best things I've done. It's been absolutely great. There, there was a period of frustration there yes. at one point yeah. when it felt like we just weren't going to get there. Mm. We were circling round and round and round the ideas and couldn't couldn't quite settle on anything mm. but we did eventually yeah yeah so it, do you think that will make you as you continue to work independently you'll reflect on your own practice through working collaboratively um yes i think um I, i'd i'd for some time wanted someone that I could talk to at the level I want you know at this kind of mm. level about my mm. work and I found that with yeah. Christina and that's an absolute treat actually because not everybody wants to do that so I know if I'm stuck on something or want an idea or an opinion mm. that I'll get an honest one 
Same here, actually. <laughs> yes, because, yeah, I do, I trust Rachel to say, actually, I don't think that works. You know, I, I feel that if I have a query about something, which always happens, uh, and if I ask, I'm not just going to get, oh, that's lovely. I'm actually going to get some really, some, some useful feedback about it, you know, real feedback that's going to be constructive. And we've enjoyed the process so much, I think, that we were thinking of doing some an exhibition together in future. Mm. And and to to include pieces, um, before we did this collaboration, we tested, we tested out whether we would be okay with it by uh, doing a tiny project. So you did something and sent it in a post to me and we were allowed to do whatever we wanted to it. So there was a lot of, you know, how naughty shall I be with this piece you know would she be all right if I completely burnt it whatever you know so we did some very strange things to test out how okay we were about changing each other's work because we're collaborating on a piece and that letting go of some of your own ideas and it yeah. was immense fun so we're thinking now actually that batting and forward of materials that we've had to do to make the chair we want to carry that on um, and we want to do some pieces where we offer each other a set of materials and the other person it gets sent and they will do something and we might change each other's work, so. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Because we had too much fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, just to finish off, how, how do you feel, um, how, how do you see the future of craft, both in its present guise and in response to global, political, social, economic and even environmental changes? Um, well, I'll say a bit, then you'll yeah, probably say <laughs> more. Um, so I, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I think um, there's a few things that are changing craft. I think the, the idea that there's so much out there um, that we don't need to make necessarily, we, we make because we have a need to make, not because we... Um, need the thing we can buy the thing much more easily most of the time so um, for example in um, in the textile world things were made on, on a domestic uh, kind of sphere really because we needed to make things all because that's how what, what women did and perceived as their role all those sorts of things whereas now we make things because we would like to make something there's not a need to make um it's not utilitarian. No, from from a money point mm. of view, it, mm. it, for me, it's more from a well-being kind of angle because there's something in us that wants to create. Um, but we have so many resources at our fingertips that actually it's very easy to have a go at lots of things. And so, um, I'm not sure about the future of like traditional crafts because I think you if you stop needing the need for something, then it it, it may go. Um, other things will take their place, but I think my sense is that there's not as much m mastery as there might have been in the past because you can just have um, a try at so many things that it, it, it there's not the need there to do it and there's so much around so many resources around at the moment that um, it's just very easy to have a go at everything and then perhaps not take it as far as you might in the past um, and I think the web and technology, you know, you can see everything out there. Um, that's kind of added to that a bit. So, yeah, I think craft is changing to be something that we do because we have a need to make and not because we have a need to produce something mm. uh, from a value mm. for money kind of mm. point of view. Yeah, and I, and I, I also think that the the more sort of traditional idea of craft is going. Although there was a lot of mechanisation in the Industrial Revolution, it's like it's, it's, it's still evolving. And something like, say, a piece of lace can be made so cheaply, mechanically, that and, and the handmade stuff is not really valued. A, it's desperately expensive. It's, it's very elitist, really. Only the rich can afford it. Um, which is what William Morris was fighting against, and it's still true. And you can't fight against made in China in terms of craft. I saw, I saw that happening twenty years ago, really, when um, people who made things by hand 
couldn't compete with the kind of price because because a lot of people who are buying stuff can't see the difference between something made in China or not enough difference between something made in China and something made by hand with with years of experience for instance so that seems to have died out and it seems to me that craft has sort of moved over into um, as I was saying earlier more arty craft uh, that's a, I think it's easier to earn a living that way because that's a lot of it does come down to that. If you're if you're actually if if you're if that's your livelihood, you have to make a living. So if you are making, for instance, skilled one-off pieces, you're gonna sell that. I think more easily than something that's uh, what's the word at the lower skill level, but rep, you know production work. It seems like the the kind of production end of craft isn't really that viable anymore and I don't think it's valued either but at the same time what I think I'm seeing is that um, there is a growing awareness that making things that immersive quality the solution finding aspect of of making things um, is be, is being more valued more recognized maybe not widely but in certain circles I keep seeing articles that say you know mental mental health mental well-being you know the way to get through the stress of a competitive working world is to do these things you know sewing is good for you knitting is good for you all those kind of things which are traditional crafts um and although yes there is that like you were saying that thing of um sort of trendy sewing mm. Nonetheless, a lot of people are beginning to do it, and I, I don't think there are fewer people doing craft, yeah, or, or doing making. Mm. There might be fewer what I'd call craftsmen, as in craftspeople, but I see, for example, the skills that people have, say in embroidery. What I see is, is people employing those traditional skills mm. in a way that's about application. So they're not making a traditional thing mm. that has been made for years. They're doing new stuff with it. It's skills that are being applied in different ways. Yeah, I'd agree, mm. actually. Yeah, yeah. You still have to learn the techniques. I, I still think that's valuable. Um, and and you need to hold on to it because, yeah, it's the basis, isn't it? How mm. to thread a needle and how to put it through the fabric, for instance, is a basic skill which you don't, you have to learn, yeah. So I don't, yeah. And like I was saying earlier, I personally don't think that we we because of our resource issues as a planet, I don't think we can maintain uh, a sort of endless um, progression of technology simply because of energy uh, resource issues. And that, and I, I, I personally can see a return to making things by hand, which would suggest the importance of educating yeah. the younger generation towards the value of making. Yes, yeah. And uh, I mean, I've trained on creativity, you know, for years with um, for small children, you know, with with adults, and um, it's the bit that's absolutely delightful. It's just, you know, it's so much part of us it's really sad that the mm. education has largely kicked that out but there are pockets of you know good practice and I think schools and educational establishments that are doing well actually they're the ones that have got the room um, to, to allow some of that back in and are starting you know there are pockets where, where they're exploring that more so and that they're looking to do the things that we have to do like you know literacy achievement or whatever numeracy achievement but they are starting to look at, um, re-examine what they've um, lost through the arts. And, you know, that that is the natural way in for children mm. to, to explore that and some of the other things that have got targets and outcomes by them. Um, the the other... Yeah, the research is there. I've seen, mm. lot, I've read lots of pieces of research saying how important all that creative creative work is. It's just filtering it into, the, yeah. into real life. Uh, in the actual in the education system in terms of the um like sustainable materials and the renewables um that that's writ large in my 
sort of area of, of textiles really um, and that's driving new work um, because um, you know the textile industry is mm. is the worst one isn't it for for waste um, and where we live here Huddersfield is um, a, I mean I don't know much about the fashion industry and, and what have you but it the the making of the the wool suiting and everything there's quite a lot of innovation happening now and it's driven a a, f a festival this year actually all about textiles not just looking back at all the mill heritage that's around here but actually what people are doing now in the textile industry um, which is quite heartening um, on a craft kind of level if you like um, you, you know even in here you can see um, materials that are um, recycled that kind of thing and um, it, it drives an attitude um, as to what's acceptable and of worth so we were, we were talking about the use of plastics you know so it, it's slightly now frowned upon if you were to make something that was heavily you know in need of plastic uh, a lot of mm. people are recycling things and there is a sense of that being uh, you know commendable and not wasting um yeah and kind of all the mm. reusing or or finding new things to use that are not wasteful uh, is is a large part actually of the way i think textile art is is going at the moment yeah and in my practice i have for um 20 years been uh, deliberately consciously working in a low tech way that if i can find a low tech process i will the kind of work i do is very low tech anyway and yes, I do recycle. Most of what I use is recycled, you know, material. So for me, that it, it's a real big one. Uh, is so I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be increasing. Uh, what's the word? Digital or, or, you know, a technical technical way to go at all. I've gone the other way, and now, yeah, th there there is a it's commendable now to be doing that mm. and uh, I can possibly see that um, growing maybe yeah 